we have just come into the new year and uh, I am very sure that many people have made resolutions and today morning I am going to be talking about pleasing God and just before we go into that uh, very small and minor correction uh, about uh, the introduction that was given to me it says here that I uh, is a guest lecturer you know uh, uh, at uh, and systems consultant at ECI seminary it's not is a guest lecturer but was a guest lecturer that's the only difference because now I am based in Imphal and I'm no more in Calcutta so therefore uh, I was a consultant but not now anymore since I'm in a different place but before we plunge into the study of the text shall we just bow down for a few moments in prayer okay almighty and everlasting God it is my prayer that every word that we hear with our outward ears will be so inwardly grafted in our hearts that they will bear the fruits of obedience through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now I was talking about pleasing God and exactly the opposite of pleasing God would be displeasing people. Right? The opposite, the diametrical opposite of pleasing God would be offending people. So. I don't know if I can ask you to do a little bit of an exercise and whether you will be offended in that or not. And the exercise is very simple and I just want to ask a question to you people and if you can respond by raising your hands, uh, it would be a little nice. And the question is, what would you, how many of you would be happy because many of you don't know me yet, excepting I think one person over here whom I accidentally met in the morning who knows me for a long time and I was her pastor in the church there in Chinmay Nagar Methodist Church. Uh, other than her, I think most of you don't know me. My question is this, how would you like it if I would continue preaching and preaching and preaching and I went on up to 12.30 this afternoon. Um, pastor is already nodding his head in a direction which says he would be certainly offended. You know, How many of you would be offended by, by that? Just want a response. Yeah, I can see that, you know, because you got a whole Listen day pipeline. You know? How many of you would not be offended? Oh, there is somebody, praise God. I mean, there is someone who is right. so keen. So, and if I really did take this sermon up to 12.30 in the afternoon, it would disrupt your 9 o'clock service. And I am 100% sure that next time I will never be invited to this church again. But let's, you know, for the sake of exercise, can you say 12.30? Can you say that? Yeah, 12.30, everybody? I can't hear. Oh, you got it, 12.30. If I did it, you're all going to be offended. But let's look at the text over here. I, I, the text today that was read, I'm reading from 23. Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry and Jesus was known as the son of Joseph. Joseph was the son of Eli. Eli was the son of Mathat. Mathat was the son of Levi. Levi was the son of Melchi. And this long list goes on. And you might have got bored when the scripture reading was being given. Right? Nobody was paying attention. It was time to drift a little bit back uh, in our mind to what we have pipelined for the rest of the day. But there is a very specific reason why Luke did this. And today I am going to draw your attention to as to why Luke put this particular genealogy of Jesus Christ. Okay? After the announcement of a birth the birth of John the Baptist to Zechariah and to Elizabeth after the announcement of the birth to Mary of Jesus after the meeting you know and there are 14 events that take place actually you know uh, before this passage we come to this almost before we come to this passage and then the various infancy narratives and after that the baptism of John and Jesus being baptized and then after that comes the genealogy unlike the Matthew's gospel and in Matthew's gospel, we read about Matthew tracing the genealogy of Jesus Christ all the way up to Abraham. Showing the genealogical continuity between the Old Testament and the New Testament and bridging the gap over there as if it's the, it's the, it's the bridge between the New Testament and the Old Testament. Whereas Luke takes the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ not up to Abraham but all the way up to Adam. And of course, John does something better than that. He goes all the way to the beginning. In the beginning was the word of God. But Luke has a very specific purpose here in putting this genealogy in this fashion after these various events. And why is it so? 
in romanian villages it is common to be asked whose are you they won't ask who are you but they will ask whose are you and by giving the names of their parents it leads to assumptions of their about their character in tamil nadu when i came some many 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 years back for college uh, and uh, i just i knew how to speak tamil but i did not understand idiot idiomatic tamil and i was traveling in the bus and somebody asked me nambu oor edunga and i got confused nambu oor how would i know his hometown and my and nambu uh, so i didn't know but then i thought maybe he is asking mine but his grammar may be bad so he is asking me nambu oor but over a period of time i found out from my friends that actually nambu oor is a respectable way of asking which is your hometown okay if i asked him which is your hometown in tamil unga oor edunga it's rude so the 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 culturally acceptable way is saying nambu oor edunga but over a period of time i came to understand it has got other dimensions if i go down south and somebody in tinnavalli ask me nambu oor edunga the meaning is what is your caste nadara vellalara hmm and the daridra is there in our communities even after becoming christians you know so when they are when somebody asked me and i realized this is what is going on when somebody asked me again when i was in kodaikanal somebody asked, uh, uh, one person from uh, the south, south complete south background is nambu oor edunga so i looked at him and i said paralogam heaven that's a nice way of deflating you know uncomfortable questions so when we come here there are many reasons why luke is putting this genealogy and very one of the very first reasons is in the ancient world genealogies had an essential function of historical continuity in jewish life and to establish that historical continuity luke is putting the genealogy of jesus christ over here the second reason linked along with that is it authenticated their racial purity within that community especially when the jews after they returned from babylon that racial purity was compromised the jews who were in juda in 586 bc babylon attacked jerusalem was destroyed it was made into ground zero they were carried off as captives to babylon how shall we sing this lord song in a strange land they were there for 70 years and then in three waves they came back one wave came under the leadership of nehemiah a second wave came in ezra chapter 1 under the leadership of zerubbabel and shial and joshua and the third wave came in the seventh chapter of ezra along with ezra as their leader and when ezra came back uh, and uh, they were they were celebrating the, the their roots and they were celebrating that they came back to the promised land because god had punished them for going away from him and in the ninth chapter he comes to a terrible uh, uh, witness of watching and discovering that many of the jewish people who returned from babylon had compromised their racial purity by marrying non jews and he set about that crude task of separating the the mixed communities away because he was bothered about the racial purity because that what that's what god wanted at that particular time from them so that they would be obedient to god and god's judgment would not come upon them again we read about that in a different way in the book of 1 corinthians chapter 6 verses 14 to 16 where it talks about uh, uh, that do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers but translating that the racial impurity had crept in and during the intertestamental period that 400 years so many things happened especially the greek empire came in and there was greek culture and there was hellenism and many of the sadducees they wanted they made they dressed like the greeks they they talked like the greeks they they made political connections they wanted to retain their leadership over the whole of israel and so they bartered their jewishness for political power and in the process they would not even circumcise their sons because they wanted their sons to partic- participate in the greek games 
where they had to be naked and if they were circumcised it looked ugly so they did not even circumcise their children and so, so there was this racial impurity but here the placement of this genealogy by Luke was to remove all genealogical doubt about the lineage of Jesus Christ that of course was the second reason the third reason is that this is not merely a family tree to boost our credentials as we do today but it endorses their place within G the place of Jesus Christ within the G Jewish community in the same way our passport or our ration card or our Aadhaar card does so it placed Jesus Christ in that Jewish community fourth furthermore while Matthew travels all the way up to Abraham and endorse the messianic credentials Luke traces it all the way up to Adam to show that Jesus was the son of God why because Jesus did not have any father but God and the Holy Spirit by which he was impregnated and Adam had no other father but God if you look at the genealogy over here it says Jesus was the son of Joseph and it goes on and goes on and in the end it says in the 38th verse Seth was the son of Adam and the and Adam was the son of God so Adam was son of God and Jesus was son of God Adam because he had no other father but God and Jesus because he had no other father but God so that was the fourth reason why we find this genealogy genealogical list mentioned over here again the fifth reason is that Luke unlike Matthew places the genealogy of Jesus Christ after the childhood and after his baptism and this was for two reasons number one was to establish the messianic credentials of the ministry of Jesus Christ and secondly to place Jesus Christ as a historical figure on the political map in the second season, uh, chapter we read about uh, Joseph and Mary traveling back for the census to their town in Bethlehem because of a decree given by Caesar Augustus in the third chapter we read in, in, the, in the first verse it says it was now the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius the Roman Emperor Pilate was governor over Jude, Judea Herod Antipas was ruler over Galilee Philip was ruler over and it goes on okay so he is trying to place Jesus as a historical figure in the political map and in the process he is also establishing the historicity of Jesus Christ there are people in today's world who divide the historical Jesus from the Jesus of faith in liberal theology and in, in redaction criticism in form criticism they do exactly that they say that the Gospels were a result of the creative imagination of the early church but Luke makes it very clear that Jesus was not the creative imagination he was a historical figure in the political map and that is exactly why he places this genealogy in this fashion <coughs> then the sixth reason is that that this this uh, when we especially when we read just before the genealogy in the 21st verse it says one day when the crowds were being baptized Jesus himself was being baptized and as he was praying the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove and, the, and a voice from heaven said you are my beloved son and I am fully pleased with you so you see over here that this verse 22 it resonates with Psalm 2 and verse 7 and I'll read that for you Psalm chapter 2 and verse 7 where it says today I have become your father today I have become your father and that is a resonance uh, from Psalm chapter 2 and a second resonance is from Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 1 where it says look at my servant he is my chosen one I am well pleased with him and I put my spirit upon him Psalm 42 uh, sorry Isaiah 42 and verse 1 in this way he is establishing the messianic messianic credentials of Jesus Christ beyond doubt when we look at these two references from the Old Testament which have been juxtaposed together in the baptism of Jesus Christ 
it is to understand Psalm 2 was a coronation formula for the messianic king whereas Isaiah 42 verse 1 was an ordination formula for the servant of the Lord and we find both of these together and Luke makes that interpretation of the baptism of Jesus Christ by telling what happened over there that when he was being baptized and this is what happened of course the most important thing in today's passage is the seventh point and that is what happens when we read the 22nd verse and it says the Holy Spirit descended on him in the form of a dove and a voice from heaven said you are my beloved son and I am well pleased with you you see the author is making a contrast and the contrast is between verse 22 and verse 38 Adam was son of God Jesus was son of God Adam was son of God and he was not well pleased with him and Jesus was son of God and he was well pleased with him in Jesus the beloved son we have the restoration of all mankind and Adam the son of Jesus God we have the banishment of all mankind and I brought you to this text this uh, this critical text the 21st to 22nd verse it says that I am well pleased with you I don't know oh, I, 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 many of you may have made New Year resolutions but I long back gave up making New Year resolutions because I realized that God is not wanting from me a seasonal uh, decision in which I make resolutions I constantly make resolutions sometimes many times each day sometimes once in a week sometimes once in a day sometimes once in a month but uh, sometimes it's moment by moment whenever the Lord tells me something and I'm struck in my heart it is time for me to get on my knees before God so all my life I have realized it's it's not just one resolution that I make in New Year but the entire year I keep on making resolutions and somehow I desire that I become like what Jesus wants me to be so that God will be well pleased with me too because as it says in that hymn that we sing you know prone to wander Lord I feel it prone to leave the Lord I love so I am prone to wander. I'm, I'm, I, 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 I get, I, I, my mind wanders so very easily. And here we read over here where it says, I am well pleased with you. But you have to remember something. Because the next line is in the 23rd verse. And in the 23rd verse it says, Jesus was 30 years old when he began his ministry. But, if we jump to the previous chapter the second chapter and the last verse after Jesus got lost and the parents were searching for him and they found him in the temple and they asked him why did you do this to us and then he returns back obediently to his home and the chapter ends by saying so Jesus grow, grew both in stature and wisdom before God and man and at that particular point in his life Jesus was 12 years old why I am saying this is because from 12 years old to 30 years old the conclusion on the life of Jesus Christ by God from heaven the father is that I am well pleased with you that's why I try this exercise with you 1230 to make you remember that from 12 years old to 30 years old Jesus led a life on the inside of his heart with which the father was well pleased I am very sure that many of us have accepted Jesus Christ and we call him as our Lord and Savior and some of you may have done it about a few years back and some of you may have done it 10 years back some of you may have done it 30 years back or 40 years back but how many years back you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ I don't know but today when the Lord looks at you and your life and the life that you led all these years can God say Noel I'm well pleased with you 
today we need to really examine our hearts that from the day I received Jesus till today if God looks at me is God well pleased with me it is very scary to look at this text but that's how Luke places the life of Christ in this genealogy and in the events that are there before and after today God is calling us to examine our hearts that we may find out what are the flaws within us what are the dangers within us in fact it doesn't require much effort we know what is the problem with us because we we have gone to God not once or twice we have gone many many times with the same problem asking God God please forgive me one more time and today we need to come back to God in repentance and say God I want you to look at my life at least from now on so that in the years that follow after this at the end of it you will say I am well pleased with you and that's why it's a time for resolution again as we come into God's presence shall we bow down our heads in prayer you may have heard my voice thundering in your ears in this time of prayer but if you have heard my voice I would like you to ignore my voice but I don't want you to ignore that still small voice that is prodding at your heart because that's not my voice that is the voice of the spirit and that is a voice that we cannot ignore that is a voice to which we have to surrender and this morning let us come into God's presence and spend some time in silence and surrender ourselves to God during this time of silence in which you can make your own quiet prayer to God this morning I offer you this time of silence to make your own prayer to God and say God help me I want you to help me help me to live a life that will please you and if that is your prayer you can surrender yourself to God this morning in this time of silence Father I bring into your presence every head that is bowed down and every heart that has been praying and I pray Lord that you will grant us the spirit to quicken our consciences from within that in all the moments and the days to follow through this year we will continue to keep pleasing you we ask this prayer and ask your blessing upon it through Jesus Christ our Lord Amen <clears throat>